often don't remember to do and then uh, share my screen. Just a minute. And what we are going to do is Does that look like slides to people? It does. Awesome. So <clears throat> I'm going to do a little bit more of an introduction um, about myself in a second, just because I personally find it kind of interesting to know who in the world is talking to me. Uh, but I am Ashley Toth. I am the horticulture agent for Durham County Cooperative Extension. I help oversee the Master Gardener program. Uh, and if you signed up for Ecology 101, you are in the right room. So uh, this talk will be recorded and we'll send out the recording afterwards as well as a copy of the slides. I'll also be sending out recordings of the two previous talks we've had in this series, which were um, the dirt on soil and warm season veggie gardening. Uh, we have two more talks coming up. Uh, this is part of a full series. The talks we have coming up are the care and keeping of trees and the good, the bad and the bugly, pest management in the garden. We also have a full part of our series um, that's kind of our live portion of the series, and this is held over at Briggs Avenue Community Garden, and we have sessions all through the year that are part of that series. Now, it's a lot about vegetable gardening, about propagation, about um, setting up pollinator gardens even to support your vegetable gardens. So it's it's a little bit more food focus, focused, but certainly not exclusively. And I would just recommend that you go and check those out. Some of those live sessions have already filled up because we have limited capacity for those, obviously, but um, it's always worth contacting me if there's one you're interested in that is full and we'll see what we can work out. For those of you who are not familiar with Cooperative Extension, uh, what are we? <laughs> like, what is this free talk that you're attending, right? So Cooperative Extension is a nationwide network of researchers, educators, and volunteers. And it's all um, basically created by Act of Congress, which is pretty impressive. Uh, and what it is, is it is a product of the land grant institutions in our state. And for North Carolina, those are North Carolina State University and North Carolina A&T uh, University. And so uh, it's a partnership between the state land grant colleges and the local counties. And it means that we do all sorts of cool work to get you research-based information. So we take all that amazing research from the university and we get it to you in whatever way it's most relevant. And so in Durham County, that includes everything from the Master Gardener Program, which you see a picture of here, through to um, 4-H for kids, family and consumer sciences, which is a lot of nutrition um, and home education. And we also do a lot of support for zero to five families. Uh, we run uh, Welcome Baby out of our office and the diaper bank, not the diaper bank, um, the Welcome Baby diaper service out of our office as well. So we kind of are a full one-stop shop for <laughs> any age group who wants to uh, get support. If you ever need help with any of your gardening questions, you can always reach out to the North Carolina uh, Master Gardeners here in Durham County. We have an amazing group of Master Gardeners. Monica is one of them. We have several of them on this call. They do everything from give talks to run demo gardens to uh, answer questions, right? Like they always want to get a picture of your weird plant, your weird bug, the weird spot on your leaf, whatever it is. And you can email those to mastergardener at dconc.gov or you can give them a call. In kind of more normal times, we also have office hours, but obviously that is suspended right now, but we're hoping to get back to that in the future. If you're um, the kind of person who lurks before you ask, I know I actually am, uh, you can also interact with us via any um, different, any number of different means on social media. So we have a great blog with all sorts of different information on it. We have a Facebook page, we have an Instagram page with awesome pictures and facts and links to information, really, really useful. And if you think this all sounds totally great and you're ready to dive right in, uh, this is actually a year for a training class. So typically our trainings are in the spring. And so I've, I've been joking, not joking, about how this is your once in a lifetime chance to take a fall master gardener training class. So that will be starting this August. It's a 16 week training class where you get to go through and take a pretty uh, rigorous uh, course of classes. And then you are able to be a master gardener volunteer and you get to help give back to your community uh, with research-based gardening information. So if you want to learn more about that, check out that link. Um, and I will include all of this in a follow-up email after the class. So that's a little bit about extension. That's a little bit about the Master Gardeners, um, a little bit about me. So I am originally from Indiana and I spent my, I'm originally from Michigan, but I grew up in Indiana and I spent my summers going to a summer camp in Michigan uh, called Camp Eberhardt. I loved this place. I got to spend all my time 
hiking out to the swamp and IDing trees and doing all sorts of stuff that like, I think even confused the counselors at the time because it was a lot of me like just collecting leaves and trying to learn all the species names, um, which is like a kind of a weird compulsion for a 10 year old, but I was really, really into it. And this is a place that I think really encouraged my love of nature. Um, also in the family I grew up in, it was just something we talked about a lot, something we were very aware of. And so when I got ready to go to college, I went to school for biology at Indiana University. One of the things I got to do that really was I got to work in Western Virginia at a research station there, again, doing beetle research and also doing, helping with some bird research. This is me holding a little junco that we'd caught in a net. While I was in college, I also did a fair bit of work with a food pantry. I did volunteer management there. Um, and it was a food pantry that really focused on um, gardening and organic produce as well. So they had a number of their own gardens, which was really amazing. For some of the beetles I worked with uh, all through college, this is my first publication was about beetles and it was about basically whether dung beetles like horse dung or cow dung better, which is, you know, like when you're going out and collecting food for those beetles, you really, you buy name brand Ziploc bags, you know, like you get really good at paying a little bit extra to make sure your food collection tools do not explode. So that was really fun. It was my research in undergrad that took me to Duke. That's how I ended up in Durham for my PhD. I knew that when I came to Duke, there were two things that were true. One was that I wanted to work in insects and I didn't want to do field work. I had learned that about myself. So of course, because, you know, the best laid plants of mice and men, I ended up doing field work on plants uh, <laughs> for most of my research. And what I was really, really interested in was how a West Coast wildflower was adapted to its native environment. And really the question was with these little plants, uh, they're called monkey flowers. What was it about the variation within a single population of monkey flowers that made them so special? It's some of the highest levels of variation we've seen of any species. And so I did a lot of research on that and it really, really gave me a really strong understanding and appreciation of the context of how things evolve and the context of variation and what native communities plant communities, plant and animal communities need uh, in terms of variation and in terms of fits between each other. And we'll talk about that a lot today. After I got done with that, uh, I said, that's really, really fun. That's really great. But actually this is just part of the glamorous work I did. I spent most of my time actually sitting at a computer analyzing data. And I said, this is enough of this. I wanna get back to plants and I wanna get back to people. So I came to work with Cooperative Extension. I've loved my time with the Master Gardeners and loved my time sharing research-based information with the public. So that's a little bit about who I am. This is the follow-up picture to that Junko picture. This was me letting the Junko go. And I feel like that is still roughly how I feel every time I interact with nature, just like a little bit of shock uh, and a fair bit of awe. So I just love that follow-up. So for today's talk, uh, we will be talking a little bit about ecology. We'll be doing a basic primer on ecology so that you understand kind of why we plant natives. Um, I think that there's a lot of conversation that we should plant natives, but I don't know that we're always explained why. So that's important. Uh, one thing I'll mention is that throughout the talk, if you have questions, just drop them in the chat. Uh, the chat button is typically at the bottom of the screen. We will also have some times throughout the talk where we'll stop and take breaks and you can answer, you can ask questions there. And so what is ecology? Ecology is the study of relationships among organisms and, and between organisms and the physical environment. So this is really, really important. It's not just how organisms interact with each other, both within and across species, but also how those organisms interact with their environment, right? How they interact with the, the soil, the water, the air, the environment. And so in order to understand this a little bit more broadly and to understand how it applies to native plantings and why we do that, we're gonna learn to think across scales. We're gonna learn about, a little bit about the role of plants uh, in food chains and food webs and in the environment some of the virtues of variation. Why do we care about variation? What are the different types of variation? Uh, some of the kind of wonder of evolved relationships. I think that once you start understanding how complex some of these systems are, it paints a pretty strong picture that we need to preserve as much as possible because we just don't know really what's important and what's not. And it's probably safe to assume much of it is not, or most of it is important, I guess I would say. And finally, We'll learn some really straightforward stuff on how to foster diverse native ecosystems. I like to think of this like as the pulling it all together portion of the talk and you'll get some examples of plants and how you can find more information about plants that you might be interested in. <laughs> we will stop about halfway through the talk, take a little break, 
answer some questions, and then we'll come back for the second half of the talk. So to start, we want to think about relationships across scales. And what I mean by this is those deep ecological relationships. And so within uh, different relationships, you have relationships within individuals, right? So this is a single um, species, if we're just focusing on the red ones of pitcher plants that are growing native in North Carolina, which is like one of the coolest things about North Carolina is that we have so many native carnivorous plants. So those are relationships between individuals. You also have relationships between populations, right? So you can imagine, right, that the pitcher plants, these red pitcher plants growing in this area might actually be slightly different than the red pitcher plants growing 100 miles away because they don't interbreed that much, but there's still relationships between those populations. And it's important to understand how those different groups correspond to each other. We also have interactions. So this is how uh, they actually interact with each other, how they kind of move together. And that's moving out into the broader community, right? So there are now relationships across species. So these red ones are actually a different species than these yellow ones. They're growing in a community with this grass. They're growing in kind of a broader community with trees as well. This is um, Longleaf Pine area on the coast of North Carolina. You have the broader ecosystem, right? So the ecosystem is going to be kind of the natural environment of this area, and it will include all of the plants in that area. So, but it will be impacted by the soils. It will be impacted by the water. It'll be impacted by all of that. Moving out into the landscape, which is even kind of a broader interpretation of that. So it's kind of like, in the way we think about individuals and populations, we think about ecosystems and landscapes, right? Broadening out again. Finally, out to the region. So um, prior, to Europeans, um, longleaf pine savanna, which is what this is indicative of, was actually extremely widespread. It was one of the largest ecosystems in the United States. And so you can think about that as kind of the region that these guys are part of. And finally out to the biggest, which is the biosphere, right? So this is gonna be impacted by like huge, like climactic variables and like the magnetic field of the earth and solar flares and right, all sorts of other stuff. All of it is going to impact the earth and is gonna impact um, how the plants and animals and environment work with each other. And so that's kind of what we think about when we think about thinking about cross scales. And ecologists will study all of these different scales and they're all a little bit different. And so kind of the biggest question and the smallest question, right? Which is where does energy come from? Terrestrial energy, so energy on land, all comes from the sun. And we have one group of organisms basically that are able to capture that for us. And those are the plants, right? So plants are producers. That means they capture sunlight and turn it into sugars and carbohydrates. And so I'm having a little bit of trouble with my Zoom for a minute. There we go. <clears throat> so they are able to capture the sunlight and they are able to, uh, through photosynthesis, turn it into sugars and carbohydrates. And basically they provide the building blocks of the rest of the food chain. So this is really, really important because without plants, you just couldn't capture that energy. And if you can't capture that energy, you basically can't get the entire cascade going. And what do I mean by cascade? I mean, the movement of energy through an ecosystem. So again, we see you know, the sun up here and we have grass capturing that sunlight, turning it into energy as a producer. And then grasshopper comes along, right? And he eats it up. He's a primary consumer. He's the one who's able to kind of deal with the difficulty of eating plants. Uh, they actually are quite difficult to eat for most things. He's then eaten by a bird who can be eaten by a snake, who can be eaten by an owl, who ultimately is eaten by a decomposer, right? Like uh, that's where we all end up, right? Is eaten by a decomposer. And as the decomposers break down and as they cause nutrient cycling, they actually end up feeding the producers as well with things they can't get from the sun. And so this is kind of what we think of as a food chain and ultimately a food web. And this all seems relatively straightforward and is like even actually from a diagram for children, but let's be real, it's always more complicated than that, right? Everybody's eating everybody. Uh, energy is moving in all sorts of different ways through these interactions. You know, obviously the owl can eat the snake as well as the bluebird. He has no qualms about that, right? So just to say that these relationships are very, very complex and it's all about energy moving through these environments, right? And through these ecosystems. But how does the energy first get in, it gets in through the plants, right? The plants are the ones who are able, actually able to capture that energy and they're actually able to kind of start moving it up the chain. And that's why we really care about native plants, right? That's why we really, really care 
about maintaining diversity in native plants. And so you might think to yourself, why is it that in some areas we have one community of native plants, right? So this is like that longleaf pine where you have these little um, Venus flytraps, which are super cool, but those are really, really different than what you would see in most areas, which is more like an oak hickory forest in North Carolina. And so the question is, why is it that in some places I have Venus flytraps and in some places I have forests and in some places I have rainforest and you know, all of these, some places I have tundra. And the reason for that is because as, as important as plants are, so much of what they're able to do is really dictated by temperature and water, right? So this is a really cool graph that I think is really interesting. And this might like remind you a little bit of what you learned in school about different types of environments. So you have annual precipitation here in centimeters. So that's how much rainfall is in a given year on average. And then you have the average annual uh, temperature in degrees centigrade, degrees Celsius. And what you'll see, right, is that this is actually really predictive. So if you have low precipitation and high temperature, you're going to have a subtropical desert, right? You're going to have a desert, really. If you have low precipitation and low temperature, you're going to have tundra, right? Like what we see up in the Arctic. So it's really typical. It's just the environment is really controlling what our plant communities look like. And so for North Carolina, where we have about 100 um, centimeters of rain on average, if you come over and we have these kind of average temperatures, for the most part, you're going to see a lot of temperate seasonal forest, right? And those are those forests we have kind of all across North Carolina. And it's, but we often are actually kind of up in this area where we have a little bit of these three different, oops, sorry about that. We have these three different types and it depends on the temperature. It's one of the reasons North Carolina is so interesting is actually because our temperature changes pretty dramatically as you go from the coast to the mountains, but our um, precipitation kind of stays the same. So you have these different environments coming together. And all of this is just to say, going back to this idea of thinking across scales, we know that plants are really important. We know that they serve as the producers. Also the environment and the ecosystem really, really dictates which plants we're gonna get um, and why we have the things we have. So we've thought a fair bit about plants, but zooming out, taking kind of a broader view, we have to think about how all of those plants actually support this whole food web, right? It's not enough to just look at the plants. We have to think about the sort of uh, services they're providing to everybody else to keep the whole diversity of the food web. And so what do I mean by that? So I'm, I mean, thinking about plant diversity and what role they play in the ecosystem. So if you think about things that have um, kind of really specifically shaped flowers or that flower in the fall or produce berries or nuts, or maybe are very specific in what can eat them, right? These are all a little bit different. And so what I'm talking about here is I'm talking about something that we'll come back to time and time again, which is this idea of functional diversity, right? So a plant that produces a nut is very different than a plant that produces a berry because there might be some animals that can eat berries, but they can't eat nuts. And a plant that blooms in the summer is different than a plant that blooms in the fall because they're gonna support different animals, right? Potentially. And you know, a tree is different than a grass. They're gonna support different animals Right? And so these are functionally diverse. They serve different functions in the environment. And so these are thought of by ecologists as functional traits. Um, and they basically, these are traits that are very, very important for the um, plants that have them because they basically allow the plants to survive in different ways. But from an ecosystem perspective, they're really important because they basically fill different niches in the ecosystem, right? They provide different things. And greater plant functional diversity leads to more diverse, resilient ecosystems. So if you have a little bit of everything, right? If you have some nut producers, some berry producers, some early flowers, some late flowers, some trees, some grasses, some everything, right? You have kind of this really diverse set of things that can support then a diverse set of animals, right? Which is really, really good because the more diversity you have, in a way, the more redundancy you have too, right? So different things are gonna kind of support different things. And it's not just that everything is kind of like a perfect straight stack but it's a little bit more that you have a foundation. And so one of the questions that people think about a lot is, okay, so if I want something that produces a nut, does it really matter what nut it produces, right? Like it doesn't really matter if it produces 
something that is native to our environment and involve, evolve for our environment? Or what if it's just any nut, right? It's a pretty tree, it produces a nut, but it is from China or it's from Brazil or it's from wherever, right? Can't I just substitute that in because a nut's a nut's a nut, right? And this is the idea of swapping parts. And so to explain this and why it doesn't work quite that easily and why the relationships that these organisms have evolved, right? The way that the plants and animals interact with each other is so important and they've developed those relationships over hundreds of thousands of years, kind of at a minimum. We're gonna do a little bit of a meta metaphor. So, so, so go with me on this one, okay? So my first car was a Saab 900 and I loved it. Um, it was absolutely wonderful. Part of the interesting thing about these cars is that, and part of the reason I fell in love with it is because my car had a sunroof. And something you can notice if you look at this picture is that the front window on a Saab is actually very, very, very up and down. Um, and what that means is that the sunroof is like directly over your head. So you feel like you are like, the sun is right there, it is perfect. And so when that car finally bit the dust and when I'd had time to kind of recover from that experience, I got a car that was probably more reasonable, which was a Mazda. And I, and I liked that as well too. And I wanted a sunroof. It's not a direct replacement though, because this car you can tell has a very, very slanted roof, which means the sunroof is now actually back here, right? So even though these two cars look very, very similar, they're actually designed differently. They're not direct replacements for each other, no matter how similar they might look to you and me. So if you think about these cars as ecosystems, right? They were developed separately. They were developed by different groups of people with different mindsets, with different approaches. And so they're built actually differently. You cannot take um, the parts from the Saab and just put them on the Mazda because it feels like they should look the same, right? Because they're not gonna connect the same. The screws might not be the same size. The holes might not be the same size. They literally might just not connect to each other or fit together. And so this is all to say that there are things that can look very similar, ecosystems that can look very similar, right? The idea that a nut's a nut's a nut. But it's very important if the squirrel or bird that eats that nut has not evolved to eat that specific species, it might not be able to digest it properly. It might not be able to get it open. It might not need nuts at the time that that tree produces nuts, right? All of these little mismatches that occur because they're not co-evolved and because they didn't have time to kind of figure each other out. Um, and that's, you know, a very personalized way of saying it, but it's really that the, the predator didn't have time to figure out how to eat the prey, right? So it's just to say that it doesn't matter how similar they look, the relationships are very, very different. And so that's a little bit about functional diversity. If we take a minute and we zoom out and we think about genetic diversity, this is, I think, um, part of the story with native plants that's often look overlooked, but is a very, very interesting. And so this is where I'm going to take a second and talk about some of uh, the research I did um, when I was in graduate school, because I think it's a really, really nice explanation of the value of genetic diversity. So uh, this is the mountain out in Oregon where I did a lot of my field work. Um, this is Cold Mountain. It's really right near where I was. And part of what's really interesting when you think about a mountain, a mountain is a really nice, clear example of different environments, right? If you're a little plant and you find yourself right here on the very tippy tip of the mountain, that's really different than if you find yourself down here in a stream, right? Those are really different conditions. Any of us who have, you know, kind of gone up into the mountains know that it's going to get basically very cold and windy, but also somehow very, very bright up here. And it's going to be nice and kind of more sheltered and there might be more water and there might be more kind of a nice condition down here. And so just kind of further example of that, this is the actual field site that we got our plants from. And it was amazing because this is not actually a large area. This might only be 40 feet by 40 feet. It's not huge, um, but plants are experiencing wildly different things, right? So the plant that grows here kind of in the middle experiences an average condition. This is a little monkey flower. They're really cute. They're only like this big. And Whereas the plant that grows down here at the bottom, they will actually be submerged in water for a good portion of their life. So they have to figure out how to live basically underwater, which is really hard for a plant and can be quite stressful. That's in comparison to the plant that grows out here on this rocky outcrop, right? It has to figure out how to grow with basically no soil, roots nestled in moss, just hoping for the best, right? Because it has like no soil, it has no water, and it's very bright from the reflected sunlight. 
right? So you and I might look out at this uh, hillside and say, oh, it's all the same, but the plants are experiencing wildly different things, right? They have very, very variable conditions. And what that means is that these plants actually might have um, really different genetics, right? So even though if I took these three plants into the lab, they might look really, really similar, they might actually have genetic diversity that allows them to survive in these different conditions. And so this gets into this kind of idea of the difference between the genetics of something and the way it looks, right? So when we think about the genetics of something, we are thinking about something called the genotype. And this is the full hereditary information. So if you think about Mark and Scott Kelly, um, who, since I used this slide last, one of them is now a senator, <laughs> which is kind of amazing. But so these guys are identical twins and they were astronauts and NASA just loved that because that was like the perfect experiment. And so from a genotype perspective, right, Mark and Scott Kelly are the same. They are identical twins. They have the same genotype, right? Because they have the same genetics because they're identical twins. However, if you think about them from a phenotype perspective, phenotype means the observed traits, right? So how they behave, maybe how long. Sometimes you'll see funny things, right? Where it's kind of like you form just a little bit differently, even though you have the exact same genes because maybe one of you got more food, maybe one of you got less food, maybe one of you is stressed at some point, whatever it might be, right? So from a phenotype perspective, they're not the same, right? One has a propensity for mustaches, one has a propensity for becoming a senator, right? Like they're a little bit different, right? They're not exactly the same. And even if you actually look at them, you can tell they don't look truly identical and it's, it's not just the mustache. Um, and so what's really interesting about this is it means that we can kind of separate these thoughts, right? Where there's genotype, which is all about your genetics and there's phenotype, which is really all about how those genetics respond to the environment, right? It's all about what do your genes do when they come into contact with the environment and how do you form? And just because I am a, <laughs> a geneticist by training, I always like to point this out. So different versions of the same gene are called alleles. And the reason I say this is because often you will hear someone say that someone has the gene for something. We all have the same genes for the most part. If you have a gene that's missing, um, that's a really big deal. And it's um, probably a medical condition. What we have is we have different alleles, right? So um, I have the alleles that cause brown hair. My husband has the alleles that cause blonde hair, right? Some people have the alleles that cause cilantro to taste like soap. Some people do not have those alleles, but they're the same gene. You just have different alleles, right? And that's just kind of a, a take home, <laughs> just cause, ugh. And so the variation that we think about, right? With genetics is really, really important because it's everywhere. And it's really, um, sometimes we know that it's very, very important. So on the right here, you have Darwin's finches. These were a real case study when people were figuring out um, how different animals kind of evolved in different places. And so a finch that has a very, very big beak like this one here, it's used often for cracking nuts, where some of the smaller beaks are used for insects and for other foods. Um, and these guys are all really closely related. Like they think like a couple finches showed up on an island in the Galapagos or on islands in the Galapagos and they formed all of these different guys. All these different variations were selected for and now they are their own species. That's in contrast to something like these coquina shells that you can find down in Florida and kind of along the coast in a lot of areas where scientists can't find a reason for these color variations, right? They might be of some use, but no one can figure it out, right? No one can figure out if there's any use here. And it's very possible that they don't serve any use. And so this is all to say that genetic variation is everywhere. It's very, very good. Um, one of the real benefits is that you can imagine actually these coquina shells say, for example, that there is no value to the variation, right? Like it doesn't serve anything. But then a predator comes along, right? Maybe a little bird comes along that likes to pick these guys up and crack their shells, right, to eat them. And maybe the blur bird sees blue really well, but doesn't see orange very well. So now this variation that had no value, we, we couldn't figure out if it was good for anything. In the new environment, right, the environment where the, where the bird is, all of a sudden these blue ones that the bird can see, <laughs> right, 
are screwed. And these orange ones have a real advantage. So just having all that variation in the population means that all of the coquina shells, that species is more likely to survive because there's the variation there that can protect it. Not all of the individuals, but some of the individuals from a changing environment. And so the reason I make this point really kind of strongly about genetic variation, um, you'll see in a second, but something I would like to really point out is this idea that it's really, really good and it's really important for native ecosystems to have as much standing variation. So as much just variation hanging out in the species, right? Like these coquina shells, even if we don't know its value now, because things might change in the future and we know they're going to with climate change. And when they do change in the future, there might be variations that were served no value in the past, or maybe were even bad in the past, or were only kind of good in the past, that are great in the future. And so if we want to think about planting native gardens to really um, support native ecosystems, even in a variable climate, we need to preserve as much genetic diversity as possible. And so part of what's important to understand is the best way to have genetic diversity that can handle climate change is not to count on mutation, right? It's not to count on new variation showing up but to preserve as much of this old variation as we already have, because there's just so much more of it, right? If you're counting on mutation, if you're counting on new variations showing up, you have to wait around for each and every one of them, right? If instead you maintain a massive pool in the background, you just keep as many different kinds of individuals as possible, chances are in the new environment, some of them will survive. And we'll be able to um, carry the species on. So in contrast to how we normally think about variation, Right, this is kind of the classic poster child for variation at this point, right? It's the X Men. Um, and there's just this story in the X Men, right, that uh, at certain periods in human history, variation goes crazy, and all of a sudden there are all these mutants, right? That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about waiting around for mutation. We're talking about taking all the variation we already have and trying to save it to allow us to be stronger and better in the future. There's always going to be a little bit of a role for mutation, but the ma vast majority of what we want is just that variation that's always there, always in the background, um, and will be what we can select from going forward and what the environment will select from going forward. So going back to this example, right, the monkey flowers on the little slope. If I wanted to go out, I would want to pull plant seeds from here, from here, from here, from everywhere. I'd want to pull plant seed from everywhere because I might not be able to see with my eyes how different these conditions are, but the plants know. And the best insurance policy I can possibly have is to maintain as much of that genetic variation as possible. And we'll talk about how you select plants to do that and how we can support this in our own gardens. But I just really wanted to drive home this idea of why does this even matter, right? Why does this genetic component matter? So within that variation, what maintains it, right? The main thing that maintains Genetic variation, sorry, I thought I had duplicated slides, but I don't. The main things that maintain uh, genetic variation once you already have it are um, gene by environment interactions. What do I mean by that? I mean that different genes, uh, different really alleles do well in different environments. So you might have an allele that does nothing for you in one environment, but all of a sudden it gets hotter or the weather gets more erratic, climate change, right? And all of a sudden that allele does really well. Natural selection, this is kind of the one we know where some um, alleles will just do better than others. Genetic drift, this is a crazy thing that happens when populations are too small. They um, basically can't hold a lot of variation. So a uh, crazy fact about cheetahs, for example, cheetahs had a thing happen to them at some point in the recent history, their recent history, where there were so few cheetahs, right? There were like apparently just no cheetahs. There were hardly any of them left. But now all cheetahs, even though there are a lot of them, are so closely related that you can actually do skin grafts from any cheetah to any cheetah and it will never be rejected. Because even though they look like there's a lot of cheetahs, it's kind of like there's one cheetah and just a bunch of clones of it, right? And that's what happens when you get really small populations is you can't maintain diversity. So it's always good to maintain big populations if possible. And finally, constraint. So this is this idea of uh, just because you see variation doesn't mean that it's good. So one of the classic examples of this is why do humans have lower back pain? Humans have lower back pain because we are not evolved to walk upright. Not really. We're evolved to walk on all fours, like a lot of our um, 
ape predecessors, we just decided to walk upright and like kind of evolved to do it, but our backs are not really set up for it. So we have a lot of lower back pain because we shouldn't have all that weight on our lower back the way we do, right? So this is this idea just that not all variation is actually good. Sometimes it's just kind of a holdover from previous forms that doesn't serve you so well anymore. And of course, sometimes it might just not do anything, but maybe it's good in the future. We don't know. And so we'll talk about, we've talked a little bit about selection and we've talked a little bit about how different forms do well in different areas. But something that's really important, especially when you're picking native plants, is to understand that when you select for one trait, you often do it at the expense of something else. And you'll see how this becomes relevant in just a second. But this is a great example, right? So this little mimulus in the middle, this is an average size flower. It's an average size plant. It flowers at an average time, right? Like it's just average. Okay, this guy on the right has a much bigger flower and the plants themselves can be like three feet high, right? Normal ones like this, but they flower much later, much, much later. And so in some years, they don't even get a chance to flower at all. And so they've actually evolved to become perennial. So to live for multiple seasons, because some years they won't get around to flowering at all. The benefit they get with those big flowers is that sometimes they have really good years and they produce a lot of flowers and a lot of seeds, but it's often hard. And then on the other hand, kind of extreme is this little guy, such a tiny flower, it doesn't even open, right? This is an annual, the flower doesn't even open. It just stays there, it stays closed, it pollinates itself <laughs> and that's it. And so the benefit it gets is that it flowers extremely early, right? It doesn't have to wait to produce a big flower. It can just do it really fast and it produces a little flower, but it also can't produce much seed, right? So there's all these kind of things, trade-offs are what we call them, right? Where you can have big flowers and you can have them late, or you can have small flowers and you can have them early, but you can't have both. And I like to think of this as spending energy from the account, right? You only have so much energy, you only have so much money in your account and you have to make choices. And so one of the classic ones we see kind of all across plants and animals, we see this everywhere, is between the size of offspring and the number of offspring. And this is how the relationship always works. It always has to work this way because you only have so much energy in your account. So as soon as your offspring get big, you can only have a few of them. And if you have a lot of offspring, they're gonna be small. So think about um, humans and mice, right? <laughs> kind of a classic one for us that are thinking of mammals, right? So humans, we have these all told actually pretty well-developed babies. Um, you know, they can like do a fair bit um, they take a long time to make and you only have you don't you only have one or maybe two at a time because they're a lot of work right whereas mice come out and they're like pink and eyes are closed and just they're completely helpless they can't do anything they're just ugh, you know <laughs> like they, they can't do anything but they can have a lot of them right and so it's kind of like you can pick one or the other and so in plants we see this one of the classic examples is this is um, a species of morning glory Morning glory will often produce like four fat seeds. So like they'll be, it doesn't look big, but it's actually quite big. You know, it's like a good size seed, but only four of them per flower. That's it, right? And that's in contrast to orchids where orchids produce such tiny, tiny, tiny seeds that in some ways they're almost more like spores. Like they don't have any food packed with them. They don't have anything else packed with them. They can produce just a jillion of them, but the seeds are toast so tiny that they don't have any food packed with them and they have to form a relationship oftentimes with a fungus that can provide them sugars. And then they get locked into this battle with the fungus where they're trying to get fungus sugar from the fungus <laughs> before being eaten by the fungus. And, and it's kind of this like really close give and take, right? So the idea is you're gonna produce a few big seeds or a jillion tiny seeds. And so why does this matter? It's all about this idea of you only have so much energy you can only put it in so many places. And once it's used up, it's used up. So one of the examples we see of this with native plants is that a lot of times there are um, versions of native plants that you can buy at the nursery that are absolutely beautiful. So this is an example of Rasmataz coneflower. This is Echinacea and it's got this amazing like double bloom that's really, really interesting. But what happens is when you start putting all of the energy into these extra petals and these extra structures and everything else like that, as opposed to this is what the native looks like, right? What the kind of wild form looks like, 
all of these areas that would have had nectar and would have had seeds, so food for insects and food for birds, have now become petals. And they don't have the energy and they don't have the right structure for the birds and insects to reach them, right? And it's because all of it was put into these showy bits instead, right? So there was a real trade-off here where this is beautiful to you and me, but it doesn't really serve much ecological value. And it actually makes this plant kind of like not useful <laughs> from a lot of birds and insects perspectives. Similarly, this is a shining sumac and it's got these beautiful purple leaves. It's called Lanham's purple. This is what the kind of more wild form looks like. And there's been research to show that when plants have purple leaves, it's actually because uh, they have put down more pigments to defend themselves against insects. And so those leaves are now actually much harder for insects to eat, right? And they've also just invested a lot of energy into this that they can't now put into other places. And so a lot of times you'll see that these really showy varieties, right, that have purple leaves, have big flowers, have all these things, we'll think of them as being perennials, but they'll actually only last for a couple of years, or will at least have really short lifespans compared to what they should have. And it's because they're putting all this energy into these really showy bits that they don't need, and they have to take that energy from somewhere, right? So it's just a, a good thing to be aware of is that there is cost to the showiness. So I'm going to go through this little section and then um, we'll, we'll put the second half of the talk as the application. The, you know, we will have covered the why and we'll get to the how in the second half. So one of the other things I'd really like to impress upon you is not only how important it is that plants are functionally and genetically diverse, but kind of how amazing the relationships between plants and animals in the ecosystem are, right? And the reason for this is because uh, these relationships are super interesting. They're evolved over extremely long spans of time and they're really complicated. And anybody who tells you they understand them as opposed to is just like in awe of them is kidding you, right? These are complicated things that we don't totally understand, uh, which is I think one of the best arguments we have for why we try to keep as much as we possibly can. So species interactions can go three major ways, right? Just like your interaction with anybody, they, these things can go three ways. They can go good, bad, or neutral. And so when we're thinking about species interactions, we kind of care about, you know, if there are two individuals in the interaction, how does it go for both of them? So in competition, it goes poorly for everybody involved in uh, predation or parasitism. Somebody wins and somebody loses. And in mutualism, this is where both parties win, right? Everybody comes out of that ahead. Competition between plants, and these will have these little kind of markers up here so you can remember what we're talking about. Competition between plants is crazy and super cool and way more complicated than we have ever understood. So plants can use any number of different cues to understand each other and to sense each other. They can use light wavelength abundance. So there's been a lot of research to show how when sunlight starts passing through leaves, the light that hits the forest floor is gonna be a different quality and kind of tone of light than what hit the top. And the plants can sense, even sometimes, you know, a plant will be growing and a leaf will get in its way, right? Like we'll start shading it and it knows and it will start growing the other way, right? So it will kind of start doing this just in response to the quality of the light that's hitting it. They can also sense if uh, they are not getting as many nutrients as they suspect they should be from the soil. So they can tell basically when other, newts are are, when other roots are growing near them because they can sense it uh, basically in nutrient levels in the soil. And I know this is all like really human emotion-y talk, but it's just more interesting that way, let's be real. Um, they sense it through all sorts of different chemical gradients and just kind of growth responses. And finally, chemical signals. So I think uh, many of us have heard or experienced the horror story that is trying to grow something under a black walnut, right? A black walnut um, is a great example of a plant that gives out a um, chemical, juglone, uh, name of the plant is juglans nigra, it gives out juglone and it prevents other plants from growing successfully in its root zone, right? So it spends a lot of energy making this chemical just to make sure nobody else can grow near it so it can have all of its nutrients, right? And you will always struggle to grow things under a black walnut. And so there's a cost to the tree, right? Like it had to spend the energy to make the chemical and there's a cost to everybody around it, but it would rather do that than have to compete. 
some of the major exploitive interactions, these are predation and parasitism. Um, so I love this picture down here because it's not often that you think of, an in, of a plant predating an insect, but that's exactly what's happening there, right? That is a sundew eating a little insect. Parasitism, we have cases like daughter and, um, I don't know what the name for this is now. It used to have a name that is probably not the right name anymore, but this is a plant that has no chlorophyll whatsoever. And what's really, really amazing about this is that it actually lives off of the roots of other plants and it will just come up and send up these little like flower spikes every once in a while. Uh, but it has no chlorophyll of its own. It can't produce its own, it can't capture its own energy. It has to steal it from other plants, which is super interesting. And also herbivory. Right, so animals and insects eating plants. And this is actually a major driving force for all of plants. So if you think about things we like from plants, uh, right, we like the spicy flavors of mustards, we like the caffeine in coffee, um, we like the little bit of caffeine in chocolate. Those are all actually defenses, right? Those were all attempts to make insects not wanna eat them. It's just humans love them, right? Same with onions, same with any of these other things. The spikes on a cactus, the kind of toxic compounds in milkweed, these, are really what drives the evolution of plants is just trying to get things to stop eating them, right? So this is kind of all the diversity you see in plants, a huge portion of it is just to try and get things to stop eating it um, with mixed results. And finally, this is a really fascinating one. So mutualism, so how do organisms help each other? Some of the classic examples, uh, pollination by insects and other mammals, seed dispersal, right? Kind of getting things, uh, if I, take a seed and I cover it in a delicious apple, will you carry it further, <laughs> right? That's the kind of logic of a plant. And also mycorrhizal relationships. And so these are those relationships uh, between plants, plant roots and fungi. And these are really fascinating. They allow a plant to greatly expand its nutrient reach. So the, the plant's roots are much smaller, whereas the, this is actually the, the fungal or mycorrhizal network. And what's happening here is that the plant is basically uh, giving the fungus sugars and the sugar is helping it get water and other nutrients from the soil. And there's an idea that actually these relationships might even happen in a way that they arc between different plants and they connect different plants. And they are able through chemical signals and chemical gradients to actually share information. Um, it's something that has been referred to by researchers as the wood wide web uh, because they think it happens a lot in trees. And this is all to say that these are really complex relationships that are really hard for us to understand and we don't always know what they're about. Uh, and everywhere we look, we find more of them constantly. Uh, so again, you're going to need a little bit of everything because we don't know what we need. And bringing it back to that wider scale, when we think about climate and we, the way we think about how it impacts things, um, there's a whole area of research around this. It's called phenology. It's the study of periodic life cycle events and their influences. And this is really, really fascinating because it's basically when do the buds start breaking? When do the flowers start coming out? When do the insects start coming out? When do the frogs start doing their thing? When do all of these things happen um, each year in and often in response to climate? And so just understanding that better allows us to understand a little bit about what's going on with the ecosystem. And some of these long-term studies around this are how, how we know that the climate really is changing and that it's impacting animals, right? Because we know, okay, well, the birds are doing certain things earlier every year it's because of climate. One of the classic examples of this is mast seeding. This is a big one in our area. So one of the biggest examples uh, is uh, oaks and acorns. And so basically there will be years where oaks just pr 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 uh, produce a tremendous number of acorns, a huge number of acorns. And it's a great deal because Squirrels can go nuts those years. Anything that eats acorns can go nuts those years. You'll have bumper crops of squirrels because you had bumper crops of acorns. And they think it's based on climate cues, but we don't really know exactly what's causing it. Um, but it is a huge kind of ecological input where all of a sudden it will just be a huge important year because there's a huge number of acorns, which is super interesting. And in case you don't believe me yet, <laughs> right? that these relationships are complicated. This is one of my favorite stories um, because it's so familiar to a lot of people, right? So we think about monarchs and milkweed and it's been a huge push in the native plant community over the last however many years is that we need to plant milkweed for monarchs, right? And that feels very straightforward. 
And so the reason we do that is because adult monarchs like milkweed, but also uh, caterpillar monarchs really, really like milkweed. They eat the milkweed and they are able to use the toxins in the milkweed to make them uh, make themselves toxic. That's actually why a monarch is colored this way. It has this bright orange coloration to tell everybody that it's toxic. Um, the caterpillars are able to do that not only because they're able to actually eat those toxins and they're able to kind of put them aside as a reserve in their body, but they also know really interestingly that the sap of the milkweed, which goes through this rib right here, is often actually, I actually just noticed it's on this photo. Um, okay, so it's on, there's another screen over here, that's why I'm looking here. So the sap of the milkweed that is going right here is a milky thick sap. And this caterpillar has evolved along with this milkweed to, to know that. And what it knows is to chew through the milkweed right here and to start eating the milkweed leaf above that because it prevents the sap from flowing up that little vein. And it means that the sap won't get out to where it is. And so it won't gum up its little mouth parts because it's just a little caterpillar. And so, you know, that milky sap will gum it up. And so not only does not only is the caterpillar evolved to be able to handle the toxins, it's actually able to handle even kind of the other things that are difficult about eating this plant, which is amazing. These guys are super dependent on environmental conditions because they, they do these massive migrations every year. And a lot of those cues are gonna be environmental cues, right? They're gonna be climactic cues. If the climate gets off, if anything about that gets off, they're gonna mistime this migration and they're gonna end up in Mexico or they're gonna end up in Canada or they're gonna end up wherever they're going at the wrong time, the food's not gonna be there, right? So they have to be lined up with the climate perfectly. Another thing, interesting thing they have to really contend with is that there's another butterfly out there, the Viceroy, that is not toxic, but thinks, hey, if I look enough like the monarch, maybe birds will think I'm toxic and they won't eat me either. So the way you can tell the difference is the Viceroy's have this black bar here and the monarchs don't. And they're just trying to take advantage of the monarch being toxic and putting all this energy into eating milkweed. And for the most part, it works, but this is like one of my all-time favorite pictures from all of biology, just because I think it's amazing that people spent their time doing this. This is a picture of blue jays. This was a research study that was done a long time ago um, where they basically fed them monarchs and they felt fed them viceroys. And so if that blue jay eats a monarch, he eats it, it's not so good, he throws it up. If he eats a viceroy, he eats it and it's fine. And he'll eat another one and he'll eat another one and he'll eat another one. Whereas if he eats that monarch and he throws up, he doesn't like it and he won't eat them anymore. So the monarchs not only have to worry about finding milkweed, climate, timing their migration right, they also have to worry about if there are too many viceroys in the area, all of their predators aren't gonna realize that they're toxic and they might eat them and this is getting really, really complicated. And if you're like me, my head is starting to spin because there's a lot of stuff this monarch has to keep track of. And then additionally, there are actually now milkweeds that were growing like this tropical milkweed that might flower all year long, basically in certain areas. And so then there's no reason to migrate. And if you don't migrate, everything gets thrown off whack too, right? So this is the story with a million different players and a million different organisms doing a million different things in climate matters. And it's not simple. Right? It's really complex. And so all we know is that the monarch likes certain types of milkweed and it likes a certain climate. And so for you and me, I wouldn't second guess it. I wouldn't plant prettier milkweeds. I wouldn't plant different milkweeds. I wouldn't do anything. I would try to recreate the best we can what we have here because there are so many knock-on effects that we're going to have a hard time understanding that it's better just to stick with what we can see and it's better to stick with what we can know. And so that's a lot of why we plant natives. It's about the complexity, it's about the relationships between the different organisms, it's about the environment. And we're going to take a short break and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the how of planting natives and how you can actually do this. And so let's take a break, um, just it's 6.59 now, let's take a break to just um, five or so after seven, so 7.05 and come back and we'll do a couple questions and then we will do get on to uh, fostering diverse native ecosystems and how you can really put this all into practice. Great. So this being the heavier section of science, um, we do not have very many questions. Only one person has a question about um, the recording and where, and where it may be available. So I'll let you address that when they come back. Monotropa, that's right. The old name for it, I think, is not, uh, it's not an acceptable name anymore. 
Yeah, and ghost plant does seem to go with the monotropic uniform. Mm -hmm. And I think Barb had, uh, the, she brought up the daughter, which I remember that. I, I don't remember how, what word or name you gave it, but, you know, the little vine stuff all over the place. Yeah, it's cool. It just wraps right around and it just starts sucking the nutrients out, which is like not how you think of a plant operating its life. It is completely scary to me and I don't ever want to see any. I've never had it um, in anywhere that I've been. Yeah. But somebody, I pointed mistletoe out to somebody in a tree recently and I went, oh, it's mistletoe. And they were like, really? That's cool. That's great and everything. And I'm like, oh, no, it's really not. I, I saw a really interesting talk on mistletoe actually when I was in Virginia. So it's been a minute, but the long story short was that the feeling was it was not taking as many nutrients as would be of concern, but it did provide habitat and resources for other organisms. But can a tree be taken over so much by mistletoe that it eventually kills the tree? Not typically, not if the tree is healthy, certainly. Yeah, I've seen some, and of course this is in the swamps of Eastern North Carolina. I've seen yeah. some very, some very heavy with mistletoe trees. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's not happening because it's just to me, it's the blockage of light alone was gonna be problematic. Yeah, we have a lot of mistletoe in the tree right behind our house. And it's always like fascinating to look up in the winter and be like, have you always been here? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, You can tell when it, when it grows, if it's, if it's around, you can watch it, you know, over the years, it'll definitely, uh, definitely has a presence. Yeah. But, um, well, the early pictures of you, I am especially loving the, the slings, the shoes that you were wearing out in the field. Yeah. Obviously, the field was not going to be your favorite thing. Okay, well that field site, in my defense, that field site, there was the there was the actual field site and then there was where I had my plants and my plants were right off the road. So you could literally just like saunter up with your like cup of coffee. <laughs> I, I still think, I mean, it's an awesome picture and then you get to the shoes and you're like, wait, what? What is she doing? Yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't put on her little field boots. What the heck? I'll, in that position, you can't wear field boots. Oh, no kidding. Your ankles are bent too tightly oh, and your whole body is hunched too much that you have to have something that basically is almost like being barefoot, which is like I, really hilarious to admit. I, I swear I'd have found something else, but you know, it didn't look like it was a really muddy site. No, it and didn't. I was wondering if those were mimulus, so I'm really happy since you called them the monkey flower. I was really happy to find out that, that I was right about that. Yeah, those are, those are. God, I spent a lot of time looking at those. <laughs> is that, was that your thesis, Ashley? Yeah. Whoa. You know, that seems so tiny to focus on. I mean, a great question, but amazingly. No, that's a totally fair assessment. It's like, <laughs> no, I mean, it's just, years later, you're like, I spent time looking at plants from one population of one species and we found some interesting stuff, but like, I need a, I need a broader reach for a little bit. <laughs> well, unfortunately you don't defend your thesis for the rest of your life, but it must have seemed like it at the time. <laughs> it, yeah, it was, a, I, there's a reason I'm here. Um, there is a reason I am here. <laughs> I'm I'm happy as a clan that you are. I'm and I'm enjoying always enjoy learning. Um, there is uh, there's only so much going back to school I can at this point. So it's so fun to learn everything else that you're yapping about here. Um, speaking of, yapping, have you have you looked at the Cornell Owl Cam lately? No, I actually don't watch bird cams much. <laughs> Well, this is the only one that I watch. Um, she has eggs. two eggs. She has two eggs this year, or an owl has two eggs this year, and I always find it interesting to watch. Yeah, but that's the only one. Yeah, I uh, can't always like handle the drama of bird cams. <laughs> well, the only I thought there was drama once when I when I tuned in to the first the first year that I did it, and and there was a a body part. You know, she's sleeping and the, there's a body part. And I'm like, oh my God, one of the babies died. And it turned actually out to be a, a snack. You know, it was the leg of something else. Um, so it was a snack for her for later on. And that was enough drama for me. I, uh, whoa. Um, 
But um, I still think it's fascinating because I don't see enough owls. We hatched owlets out of a tree in one of our yards and that was really fun. When it was time for them to move, they jumped out of the tree, these, these puff balls, they jumped out of the tree and then bounced a couple times and then waddled off the way the mother was, was calling. But when I had a Girl Scouts, we, um, one of the cool things that we got to study was owl pellets. Yeah. And um, I, I was just, I think I'm sure I was totally, although some of the girls really got into it and some of them were like, ew. So, so owls caught up a, a pellet that is, it is a fairly decent size uh, thing. And it is all of the body parts that they can, and, and anything else that I don't know about. But what we were doing with these fumigated yeah. owl pellets were, were tearing them apart so that we could see what they had eaten. The jaw bones of mice and little small creature parts and stuff. And um, it was utterly fascinating. And somebody has the business of going around and collecting or where we have owls, they're selling their pellets. <laughs> yeah, so my uh, my undergrad advisor, he's a biologist obviously, and so was his wife. And he had reconstructed a mouse skeleton from pellets for her as an early gift. And I think that when he gave it and she accepted it and they were both pleased with each other, they knew it was. <laughs> Kismet, Kismet. All right, it's 7.06 and I don't want to take right. anybody else's time with this dribble. So, okay, so we have a couple of questions. Um, tiger swallowtails, I have actually been wondering this myself. The question is, tiger swallowtails have been all over my Virginia bluebells. What local natives in our area do they get nectar from this time of year? I've been wondering actually this myself as well. I don't know for sure, but I can give you some ideas. My first suspicion is that they have overwintered as, as um, cocoons basically and they're emerging now and their job is to mate even more than it is to eat. So they're getting nectar from basically anything they can find like like bluebells, uh, like some of the early season even weeds that we have that have nectar. But they might not actually need that much nectar because their job is so much to mate more than feed if that makes sense. So there are certain um, moths especially that are really like this. So um, luna moths, cecropia moths, a lot of the really fat bodied big moths, um, they actually never even feed when they're adults, right? They don't have feeding parts because it's just not on their agenda, right? <laughs> like they, they are just there to mate. They don't need food at all. Um, and so that's my theory. My other theory is just that they're able to basically scrounge enough from anything that's flowering right now. Um, so I, that's not a concrete answer, but I suspect they don't need too, too much food. They might not last too long. This might just be kind of a short period for them just to be able to lay eggs. Um, and then black walnut. Um, black walnut puts chemicals in the soil um, and to support lightning bugs that you see seasonally in a wood pile, leave the wood pile. That is actually the, really the best you can do is, is wood piles creating a little bit of habitat. And we'll talk more about that, about different habitat amenities for insects. But I would say that if you see a place where insects are happy and where they're doing their thing and doing a good job, leave it be. Or if you can try to create a little bit more even like it, that's really the best thing you can do, right? Because they know what they like. They know what they're finding. Um, and I would just try to give them more of what they're already showing that they like. Ashley, can you tell Melissa where this recording, if it's available online after this is finished and, and how she can access it? Sure, I will send everybody a link to the recording um, tomorrow. And I will also send you links to the previous recordings. Uh, my goal is to get them uploaded to YouTube eventually. It just, because of the joy of government bureaucracy, it takes me a minute to do that. But the goal is to get them all up online for folks eventually. So with that, we are going to dive right into how we put it all together. This is a great picture. Um, I know you guys are like, Ashley, enough about complexity. But this is a great picture even, even of itself because these two chicks are not the same species. One of them was dropped off by a parasitic bird mom. And now this poor unsuspecting mom is being forced to feed it. I think it's this one with the yellow beak. Um, so just like things are not always as simple as they seem. So putting it all together, some of the big questions you might have, even though they, they're questions that seem straightforward until you try to answer them. <laughs> and you're like, wait a minute. So what do we mean by native? What do we mean by diverse? 
some sources of inspiration and ideas where you can get big uh, kind of sources of native plants, uh, specific ideas for some and for shape. A lot of times native plants are seen as like pretty pollinator flower plants uh, and those are not always good for shade and I know a lot of us here especially in the city have shade gardens so we need some shade ideas and also extra habitat amenities and things you can add to make uh, it even more inviting for wildlife. So what do we mean by native? This is a big conversation right? So kind of at first blush you might think we mean North Carolina however if you we're in the soil talk, or even if you're just familiar with North Carolina, you'll know that North Carolina is extremely variable. So from the coast up to the mountains, uh, this is a map of soils, right? Where you have these really, really organic soils out the coast, you have sands, and you have a red clays of the Piedmont, and then you have higher organic matter in the um, mountains again. The soils are very, very different. They're gonna support very different plants. The environment's also very different, and that's because of elevation. So here at the coast, obviously you're at sea level. <laughs> feels fairly straightforward. Um, as you move up into uh, the Piedmont Plateau, it's a higher elevation. And finally, up here in the mountains, uh, you, you can be at very high elevations, right? We have one of the highest elevation, we have the highest elevation point east of the Mississippi, uh, Mount Mitchell. So Mount Mitchell uh, is at about 6,600 feet in elevation. And what's really interesting about that is that from an environmental standpoint, every time you go up in elevation, um, it gets cooler right, obviously. And going from zero sea level to 6,600 Mount Mitchell is the same as if you went from sea level up to Ontario in terms of climate, right? It's that much cooler. It's that much different. You're going to see plants in the mountains of North Carolina that are like what you would see in Ontario, right? So it doesn't matter how much you love that plant grouping <laughs> you saw out in the mountains. If your home is here in Durham, it might not be the best fit, right? So it's just really important to think about what does native actually mean, right? Native can't just mean North Carolina. And so I would say that for most folks, one of the most useful ways to think about native is gonna be thinking about the Piedmont, right? So you probably heard it referred to before that we're in the Piedmont of North Carolina, that's our soil type and kind of the, the geographic region we're in, or I guess geologic region we're in. And so the Piedmont extends kind of all through this area, right? And that captures us. Um, it captures further south, it captures further north. If I was worried about climate proofing my garden, um, because we know things are getting warmer in general, <laughs> sometimes they're just getting more sporadic, I might be picking plants from down in this region of the Piedmont, so kind of where we are further south. But in general, anything that's kind of happy in this Piedmont area is going to be a good bet. Um, different nurseries are going to label native different ways. Um, uh, it's just something to ask about. It's just something to know. The USDA keeps really, really good plant databases online of where things have ever been found historically. So you can always look it up if you're trying to like be super exacting. But I would just say to know that native can mean a lot of different things. I like looking for things that come from roughly the same soil type because I think it's kind of one of the best proxies. So I'm looking for similar soil and climate, right? So I'm thinking about the Piedmont when I say native. What do we mean by diverse? We mean functionally diverse, like we covered in the first part of the talk. So this is bloom time, flower type, fruit production, right? As many different types of those as we possibly can um, because this provides for various life stages. So a lot of adult birds will very, very happily and greedily feed from bird feeders, but they do not feed those seeds and nuts for their young. When they're raising chicks, most songbirds are pretty exclusively on caterpillars and grubs. Uh, these dragonflies are lower quality. They would have preferred to have a caterpillar. I just was impressed with her that she managed to grab two of them. But in general, uh, songbirds will take thousands upon thousands of caterpillars back to their nest every year. And so they need a massive number of caterpillars, right? And those are going to come from native plants, really. That's what those caterpillars are evolved to eat. A lot of the caterpillars can't eat non-native plants. And so we need a massive number of native plants to support native caterpillars, to support native birds, and on down the line. We also want genetically diverse. This means both within and across species. We want as many different species of plants as possible, and we want as much diversity in those species. And we'll talk about how you do that and what you look for. And really, this is about maintaining the gene pool for future needs, right? That idea of you want as much variation as possible because you don't know what you need in the future and things that you didn't think were useful before all of a sudden can become useful due to climate change. So another way to think about this, because I love a comparison, is 
they actually make candy like Lego blocks, which I think is really cool. And you can build a beautiful structure, right? So these come in different shapes. They come in different colors, um, slightly different configurations, and you can build a little castle, right? And so this is this idea of functional diversity, right? The different colors, the different shapes serve a different role. And because these are shaped correctly, they lock into each other, right? They lock in at these little points just the way normal Lego blocks would. So if I tried to put a gummy worm, or if I tried to put even a sugar cube on top, it wouldn't lock in because it doesn't have the right configuration, right? It has to be made to be in this set for it to lock properly, right? That's that idea of it has to be co-evolved. It has to be something that's native, that's part of the environment to lock in properly. And if you have as many different shapes and colors as possible, that will allow you to build as many different things as possible and it'll be strong. The problem is they're made of candy, right? <laughs> so if it gets wet, if it gets too hot, maybe even if it gets too cold, they're not actually very strong, right? They lock together, they can create something that's almost like a house of cards, but they're not very strong. And so that's why you might actually want real Lego blocks instead, right? And this is the idea of genetic diversity. So the blocks lock together in the same way, but each block itself is stronger and more resilient. Can it break? Sure, it's a lot harder to break though, right? This is this idea of you want different colors, different shapes, but you want the individual units to be strong and you want them to be able to hold up against the environment. And so having a lot of genetic diversity is what allows you to do that. Incidentally, I found this funny that this also supported more species, but I just thought that was amusing. And so how do you tell the difference? How do you make sure you're pl selecting plants that have genetic diversity? Or how do you at least try? You have to know a little bit about plant naming, right? So a species, a lot of us know this, it's just the main way that plants are classified. Um, the reason I'm not being more specific than that is because a lot of biologists have a lot of feelings about what a species actually is, but most of, it will most of us will recognize a name like this for the redbud, right? This is our native Eastern redbud, Circus canadensis, uh, right? You have the genus here and you have the species here. A variety is a group within a species with unique traits. Um, they typically uh, occur naturally and they will have genetic diversity within them because they, they breed um, naturally, is how I would say it. And so one of the varieties of redbud that's out there is something called Circus canadensis um, variety orbiculata. This is an Arizona or California redbud. Um, it's more adapted to kind of hot, dry conditions, but it's very, very similar to Circus canadensis. It would even, some people would say its own species, some people would say it's just a certain type of Eastern redbud, right? So it's just a variety of Eastern redbud. A cultivar is just a cultivated variety. So this is a variety that, that humans selected and bred for certain traits. A nativar, this is another name you might run into, is a native cultivar. So it is a cultivated native. And so what do humans do when they cultivate a plant? They typically select the traits they really, really like, and they ignore everything they don't care about. This is how you end up with plants that have big showy double blooms, have purple flowers, flower at slightly different times, right? It's because humans decided some trait was attractive and they decided to try and make the plants like that. So an example of that would be forest pansy. This is a beautiful red bud with purple leaves, right? And finally, a native is a plant that lives or grows naturally in a particular region without direct or indirect human intervention, right? So without the cultivation component, right? So a variety would be native because it is something that naturally occurred. Whereas these cultivated varieties and these native varieties are ones that were, or yeah, native cultivars are things that were specifically bred by humans. And again, if we go back to that idea of spending from the account and how much energy do you have, we often are selecting things here that are at the detriment of something else. So this is our native North Carolina version, right? Circus canadensis, variety canadensis. So that's the one that's like North Carolina, very specific because these red buds actually span a good part of the country. And so a lot of folks will tell you, stick with, stick with natives. Um, don't do cultivars, don't do native ours because they don't, oftentimes they also don't have genetic diversity. Oftentimes they're not very good at breeding themselves and they actually have to be basically formed clonally they have to be propagated. They don't have much genetic diversity. Um, sometimes the insects and other animals can't even recognize them because they've been changed so dramatically. 
But I would say that there's a more kind of nuanced perspective than that if you're picking these plants. And I, I like to think of it as the non-native to native continuum, right? And so this is kind of talking about these plants, ecological and genetic values. So there's what I would consider, and, and these first two are ones I just think of in my own head as being important. So there's a novel non-native. So this is something that is not like anything else we have here, right? So I would think of this as being something like Edgeworthia, right? This is a beautiful Chinese plant, um, kind of late winter blooming, really spectacular. I have one in my own yard. I absolutely love it. There is nothing though that is similar to Edgeworthia that grows around here, right? So nothing has co-evolved with it. So nothing really eats it much. Nothing kind of knows what to do with it. Some of the bees kind of figure out that you can probably get nectar from it, but it's like a struggle, right? <laughs> Nobody really recognizes it. Next on the continuum, I would consider a related non-native. So this is something that's closely related to a plant that we have here that's native, but that species itself is not native. So I would think of this as something, being something like Chinese redbud, um, Cersus chinensis. Very similar to our redbud, but not exactly the same, right? Like the connection points between it and other plants and animals in the ecosystem might not be exact, but maybe they're close, right? Like maybe some things can recognize it, but not everything can. We have a native R. The value of these really depends on the traits they have. So this is that forest pansy redbud. And one thing we do know from studies that have been done is that oftentimes purple leaves are actually very, very hard for insects to eat. They have much less insect feeding on them, right? Which is good if you don't want insects, but not so good if you want kind of an ecosystem that can rely on itself. However, they produce beautiful flowers that other things can use and they, uh, you know, have a lot of other relationships that are really valuable. So maybe the leaves are not providing any value, but maybe the rest of the plant is. And finally, we have native varieties and natives, right? And these are really co-evolved with their surroundings. And so these are kind of what I would consider like the best of the best if I had to pick things because they're gonna be genetically diverse and they're gonna be co-evolved with their surroundings. And so a native variety, native variety would be something like Cersus uh, canadensis, so this is a red bud, the Alba variety. This is a naturally occurring variety that has white flowers. And then just kind of our good old fashioned red bud, right? Eastern red bud, Cersus canadensis. And so you can see in here, you have all these different types, all these different forms. And for me, um, unless I just really needed a purple red bud, and sometimes you just really need a purple red bud, I would probably be sticking kind of over in this area if I could. But that's not to say that these don't provide any value. And they are certainly better than, from an ecological perspective, than something that no plants or no other animals are going to recognize. And so if you're looking for sources of kind of how to figure out what's native for our area, because it can be pretty daunting, don't worry, I'll send these out. These are three of my absolute favorite. Um, this first one here is the North Carolina Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox. This is amazing. You can just search straight for plants that are native. A lot of the pictures I'm showing you all throughout here are from here. They have all the different plants that you can search for ones that are native that are for different soil conditions, different sun conditions, anything you want, just great write-ups on the plants and what they need. Um, New Hope Audubon is our local chapter of the Audubon Society and they have some amazing plant lists I'm gonna walk you through in a second that are really informative and kind of allow you to make really good choices. And finally, a native plant finder from the National Wildlife Fund, um, Federation is really, really helpful. It's also a great resource. One of my favorite things to do is to sit with the New Hope Audubon lists and <laughs> the Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox open because these are lists and these are pictures, right? And so you can like find a plant on the list that you think is cool. And then you look it up on the toolbox and you're like, oh, that's beautiful. Or like, oh, that's really toxic. Like, <laughs> it's not gonna work. So it's good to kind of use these tools together. And so when you're thinking about I'm gonna show you an example of what one of the New Hope Audubon lists looks like. Don't get overwhelmed, it's a lot of information. I just am trying to show you the breadth of information they have in their lists. So, oof, a lot, I love it though. Okay, right, so you have common name, scientific name, height, width, does it want sun, does it want shade, how much moisture? And then what I think is really cool, number of caterpillars supported. Right, New Hope Audubon, those are bird people. So ultimately they want caterpillars, right? Because they're trying to feed baby birds. And you can look at these lists and you can see just how many caterpillar species we know are supported by each of these plants, right? So you can see like the native sunflowers, 64, that's so cool, right? So you can go through and just look at this. And they were smart. They even put together a list called the Keystone List. And it takes all that information, it simplifies it, it reorganizes it from most supported to less, 
within a group, right? So for trees, shrubs, perennials, grasses. So if what you wanna do is you wanna get the absolute most bang for your buck in terms of native plants, you can just pull right off the keystone list. And I really like this because I don't know about you guys, I get totally overwhelmed when I'm trying to put together a new garden. There are so many choices. Everything's beautiful. Everything's great. I'm very excited about all of it. <laughs> and so sometimes I like to have lists to work off of because it forces you to edit. It forces you to kind of take a direction. And I actually think it's a lot easier to make really interesting choices and choices you feel confident in if you're kind of working from a smaller set, right? So you're not just going into the nursery and saying, I'll take them all. You're saying, okay, well, I'm actually really looking for maybe I am looking for a flowering crab apple because I know it's the right size. I've looked it up a little bit and it's, you know, 10th or whatever on the list. So that's perfect for me. Um, that's a lot easier than just like pick a tree, which can be a little overwhelming at times. And this I think is really, really amazing, right? The number of species and the number of caterpillars that some of these trees can support, right? So native oaks, they're up here with the absolute cream of the crop, 488 species that can be supported by some of our native oaks right, which are just phenomenal. And this is something that I think is really important to think about when you're planting native gardens, is a lot of times, you know, what's our absolute classic native plant, right, for, for pollinators? Milkweed, right? A lot of us plant milkweed, a lot of us love milkweed, and we care about the monarchs. Milkweed supports monarchs and like one or two other species. So it's great because it supports the monarchs, but if you think about something like an oak or even some of these plants that are smaller, like the crab apple, um, that supports 245 species. So if I had a limited amount of space, I might actually look at the perennial portion of this list or the shrub portion of this list. And I would go for the plants that can support the absolute highest number of insects and caterpillars because it's just the most bang for my buck, right? It can just support the most different things and there's value in just supporting as many different things as possible. Plant some milkweed too if you love it, but just know you want to think about both, right? You want to think about supporting a diversity as well as the things that you just plant because you know you love them. Another great list is uh, the top 25 native pollinator plants from North Carolina. This was put out of Chatham County by Debbie Ruse. She is a phenomenal uh, extension agent and she runs the Pollinator Paradise, Paradise Garden in Chatham County. If you have never seen it, go see it. It's phenomenal. It's inspiring in every season and it is open to the public. And she has picked her top 25 plants and she separated them into spring blooming, summer blooming, and fall blooming. And so if you were to pick just two to three plants from each season and you were to put, group them together, right? So I picked two from spring, two from summer, two from fall, and I, that was my planting bed, it would be beautiful. You would have color all summer long, all season long, basically, and you would support pollinators all year long, right? It's just that easy. And this is a great another thing where it's it's a short list, right? It's so much easier to interpret a short list than to interpret those mega lists or just all of the nursery that's at your fingertips because that can be really overwhelming. If you want to do the deep dive, the other thing I would recommend is the Mount Cuba Center. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting about this is uh, they are from Delaware, but they are actually also in the Piedmont, right? So that idea of what is native, I would consider native the Piedmont. They're in the Piedmont. And they do these amazing trials where they compare all of the different varieties and cultivars, right? They compare things to see, do pollinators like them, right? Because there's this idea that a lot of these selected plants, pollinators might not like them anymore because we selected them for, to be pretty to people, not to pollinators. Well, Mount Cuba Center trials that. And they put out these beautiful reports. This is just the one on echinacea. I thought this was really fascinating. There's about to be a graph. Don't worry, I'll walk you through it. <laughs> um, what this is, is just pollinator visits. So the height of the bar is how many times that variety got visited. And they've pulled these out over here as the ones that did not get many visits. And also they are double flowers. All of the red brown ones are double flowers. Remember that's a double flower. And they are all the ones that get the least visits. Pollinators don't like them. So they're absolutely beautiful. Have them if you think they're beautiful. I am not against having things just because they're beautiful, but know that a pollinator wants this, right? It wants coneflower that looks like coneflower and that it recognizes as coneflower. So I just thought this was so interesting where they actually trialed all of them together and said, what is a pollinator actually like? So thinking about some very specific ideas for each season, um, some sunny spring plantings that I really, really like. Stokes Aster, um, there's a version of this even called Peachy's Pick that is great. 
Um, Stokes Aster is evergreen, which is lovely. It always has green on it. It has these beautiful flowers. It kind of blooms and then it can even rebloom later in the season. It's just a charming plant. Wild indigo, um, Baptisia species, these are really, really great, really interesting um, and have kind of a nice, good structural presence in the garden, even though they pop up every year. Um, they're also interesting because they can fix nitrogen, so they can help improve your soil. They support about, the Baptisia supports about 20 different species of caterpillars. Um, finally, also uh, Golden Alexander Azizia, this is a great one. Uh, it just shows up, it's really, really reliable. It just does a good job, supports a lot of um, pollen feeder or nectar feeders. Finally, blueberries. Blueberries are really, really phenomenal. They, um, first off, blueberries are delicious. <laughs> blueberries are native. They handle our um, acidic soils very, very well. Uh, they're really quite easy to grow. Uh, you can prune them and do all sorts of things like you're a blueberry farmer, or you can kind of just let them go and they form kind of a gnarly hedge, which is great too. And the early pollinators love them. Service berry is another one. My service berry at home actually just got done flowering. Uh, they are very, very happy. One of the things I like about service berry that not everyone likes is it is one of the hosts for a rust fungus. And so like the berries will get covered in these weird like Dr. Seuss tentacle uh, fungal <laughs> structures, these orange structures later in the season. And like, if you like just nature being weird, it's a really, really good example. Uh, the berries are super tasty for the birds. You'll see the birds just mob the plant later in the season. And early in the season now the bees mob the plant and they just love it. And if you're worried about having all these bees come to your yard because you're worried about getting stung, most bees, uh, especially solitary bees, bees that hang out by themselves, don't care about you, <laughs> right? Like they, for them to sting you, it would cost them their life and it's too much of a cost. And so for example, how much does this bee care about me? I wanted to take a better picture. So I, I literally stepped right up to the tree, started turning the branch in my hand as the bee was on it. There were bees swarming all around me and like no bee said anything to me, right? They are very, very into their own thing and they will not typically come for you at all. For shadier plantings, um, foam flower is a really nice one. It's a very nice low plant that has nice green leaves um, with a lot of interesting color in them the rest of the year. This is a little plant though. It's, it's nice as a ground cover. A lot of spring ephemerals. This is a great time for this. Um, these are plants that like a little bit of sun and so they'll typically flower before the trees leaf out. So you'll often find them in forests and they kind of before the trees leaf out, they emerge, they flower, and then by the time you're in the middle of the summer, they go dormant again, so you don't see them. So some of the examples are bloodroot. These are the flowers of bloodroot. I think those are just lovely. Sundine poppy is another one that's really great. Um, has these bright, happy yellow flowers. And this uh, will set itself up and be quite happy pretty easily in your yard and will even spread a little bit in shady areas, which is really nice. It's not an aggressive spreader. It's a very polite spreader because <laughs> it's very pretty, but it will kind of slowly spread. Another great one, Southern crab apple. Uh, beautiful flowers that give way later in the season to beautiful berries, plants, or insects and animals love it. Uh, just a really good performer, can tolerate a little bit of shade, which is really nice, but it, obviously it's a tree, so it gets a little bit bigger. And blueberries, again, actually, I think this is really important to point out. Blueberries will tolerate a little bit of shade. Like they don't want full shade, but if you only had maybe four hours of sunlight, four to six hours of sunlight in an area, which is not full sun, right? Typically full sun is eight plus hours. Blueberries will still do quite well. Uh, my blueberries at my own place are all in part shade and they're happy. They're fine. They produce blueberries every year. They attract pollinators every year. Just to drive this home, Southern crab apple supports, right? 245 species of caterpillars. Blueberries support 237. Bonus one additional species, humans, humans get to eat blueberries, right? That's delicious. For summer plantings, when I, my absolute favorites is mountain mint. Um, I will say, be careful, mountain mint is not a polite spreader. It is an aggressive spreader, but I love it. It's got these really nice silvery leaves. It's got these really interesting flowers. Um, the insects love it. I went to go buy mountain mint last year at the, um, just at the nursery. And a bee stayed on the plant as I took the plant inside, checked out, took the plant to my car, and then fought the bee because I wanted to put it in the back of my car. And it just kept like, it wouldn't leave. Like it was like, no, 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 this is my home. And I, I kind of had to like finally shake it off to be like, 
you're in Chatham County and you're about to end up in Durham if you're not careful. So they love these plants. They just love them. Rattlesnake master. Oof, I love this plant. So this is one that um, almost looks like a yucca or something at the base. And then it shoots up these spikes of these round spiky flowers and are just so cool and so gnarly looking and provide a really, really good architectural presence in the garden. So they provide a really nice vertical, um, which I think is really important from just a design perspective. Rose mallow, um, this supports 28 species of caterpillars. It is a hibiscus, so it's got beautiful flowers, really, really good presence, good size on it. Uh, switchgrass, our native switchgrass, uh, Panicum brigatum, also sometimes called tall switchgrass. This supports 31 species of caterpillars. Uh, tall means tall. <laughs> the short ones are about four feet tall. It can go up to about eight feet tall. So it's a plant that needs some room, but it comes in red tints. Uh, this is Shenandoah, is the, this variety. Comes in blue tints. Um, I think there's one called Dallas Blues that's even taller, you know, kind of in the blue purple range. Just beautiful. Finally, little blue stem. This is another grass that I think is absolutely gorgeous in that it, it often has this sort of blue green, almost silver color. Uh, and in the fall, will turn into the reds and the purples at the top. Um, and these are smaller than uh, the switch grasses, uh, but they're still very, very beautiful. And they have a bunch of different varieties um, and can serve in a bunch of different sites. And so this next planting is one that is like typical for me of something that I'm just like, oh my God, how is it so beautiful? This is a typical summer to late summer planting where you have, this is that rattlesnake master here in the foreground. Uh, you have um, verbena, um, verbena. You have verbena here, this purple here. You have coneflower, right? Kind of a wild looking echinacea. This is probably Shenan Shenandoah, that variety I mentioned earlier of switchgrass, not switchgrass, panicum. Yeah, switchgrass, sorry. Uh, and then you have kind of even more going on here in the background, right? And so this is what I'm saying here where Rattlesnake Master will provide a really, really attractive vertical that will kind of come over other things that are mixing together really beautifully. So that is, I think, the sort of great combination that even if you have a little bit of space, you can actually start pulling this together. Um, some of these plants are quite big, but especially if you needed something that was a backdrop or if you needed something to create kind of a, a distinction between two areas of your yard or maybe even between your yard and the neighbor's yard, there's a way to kind of scale this down and make it work for you, right? So maybe you say, ooh, that's, that's too much for me, you know, but maybe you still keep the coneflower and the verbena and the rattlesnake master. Right, so you don't have the big background, but you still have this kind of pretty foreground. And there are ways to do that and just to think it through. For summer plantings that can handle a little bit of shade. A number of species of um, black-eyed Susan or Rudbeckia can actually handle shade. Um, not deep shade, you know, they're gonna want four to six hours of sun a day, but they still handle shade quite well. And they are also, I would say, polite spreaders. Um, you know, they spread, but it's not that hard to get out there with the shovel and kind of cut it out where you don't want it that year. Pennsylvania sedge, this handles even more shade. This is a little guy, like a little guy, which is kind of fun, but it supports um, really a good number of species. Woodland sunflower, um, there are a number of sunflower species specifically that can handle a little bit of shade. Uh, so this is, you know, you can see this is a shady condition where this guy's growing. It supports 64 um, species of caterpillars. It's really attractive, really nice kind of happy sunny plant. River oats, this guy will spread, but it's still very attractive. These are the seed heads uh, in the fall. Very, very pretty, very nice. It's a grass that grows in shade, which is actually quite uncommon. And finally, pipe vine. Pipe vine is one so it's a vine that'll grow in the shade and I'm totally willing to support pipe vine, even though pipe vine only supports one species <laughs> that we know of. And that is the pipe vine swallowtail because you thought the story about the monarchs and the viceroys was crazy. That's just two species of butterflies. The pipe vine is at the middle of like a six species complex of butterflies where everybody's imitating everybody. And I think maybe only the pipe vine swallowtail is toxic, but uh, it's just fascinating. There's a whole group of these butterflies that all look like each other and they're all trying to kind of scam off of the, the pipe vine swallowtail's toxicity, which I think is fascinating. So moving on to fall plantings. Um, again, 
more species of sunflower, right? A lot of these guys are kind of late summer, early fall. They support a tremendous number of species of caterpillars. Um, 64 is kind of the typical range for a lot of the uh, sunflowers. Goldenrods are also kind of late summer, fall. If you think you're allergic to goldenrod, you're probably actually not. You're probably allergic to other things that bloom at the same time as goldenrod. I know that doesn't make you feel better when you're having <laughs> kind of allergies, but goldenrod pollen, and pollen is actually um, large enough that it doesn't float through the air easily. So if you think you have allergies to goldenrod, I would just try to track that down and make sure that that's really the case for you if you can, because it typically doesn't actually cause allergies and it's an amazing addition to the garden. Uh, this is Solidago rugosa. It is a species, or it's a variety called fireworks. Um, it, it is a cultivated variety, a cultivar, but I will say that um, it hasn't been shown to have any problems with pollinators identifying it. Uh, and it is a nice tidy habit. It's really, really attractive. And the cool thing is it was developed out of NC State, which I think is awesome. So it's a really good native. Um, species of Monarda. So this will be uh, kind of your bee balms, your horse mints, that kind of stuff. Um, I'm cheating a little bit. This is actually one that blooms late summer. Uh, this is one called um, Spotted Horse Mint. I just think that this like light pink to dark pink gradient. <sighs> fascinating. This plant gets me every time. This is spotted horse mint. Um, but there are things like bee balm and bergamot, um, and they're very attractive and pollinators typically really like them. They are a little bit prone to downy mildew or powdery mildew rather. So they're prone to getting kind of white powdery spots on their leaves, but there are varieties that don't do that as much. And also just it's fine. Like, you're, you know, it won't kill your plants. It doesn't look as super attractive, but the flowers are very pretty. And typically they flower very, very well and are very attractive. And then they start getting those problems. So you could even cut them back at that point if you wanted to. Uh, I would also recommend uh, Bone Set. It's got these kind of delicate white flowers. Pollinators obviously love it. It is one of um, the top 25 pollinator plants for North Carolina. It performs extremely well. Pollinators really like it. There are 33 species that it supports. Um, and late blooming asters, so the fall blooming asters, this is one called aromatic aster. Uh, a lot of these are very, very attractive. They provide nectar and pollen at a time really late in the season when most things have already stopped flowering. So they have a really high value that way because they're kind of your season extenders. For shadier fall plantings, personal favorite for me is whitewood aster. Uh, this is a shade blooming fall aster, which it's like the only one that I can find <laughs> that's like that that's available commercially. Um, very nice, very attractive. Blue mist flower, also sometimes called hardy ageratum. This is one, uh, it can be a spreader for sure, but it's got really nice, um, somehow both delicate and not delicate at the same time flowers that are really attractive and a really, really great color. Hearts of Burston. Uh, Euonymus americanus. This is just phenomenal. So this is, it's not a, um, it's not that it flowers in the fall, it's that it fruits in the fall, right? And it has these really interesting, fascinating um, seed casings and these kind of really bright, amazing seeds. And it's just really striking when you see it. Like you'll, you'll stop and go, oh my God, what is that? And so it's taller, it's more of a shrub size, but it is quite a nice plant if you have a little bit of room for that. Beautyberry is another one that flowers a little bit earlier, but it really fruits in the fall and it has these shocking uh, purple berries that you can't quite believe they're real. Um, there is um, a non-native beautyberry, so make sure you're getting Calicarpa americana, but it's beautiful, it's interesting, it's really distinctive. It needs a little bit of sun to um, really fruit well, but it will certainly survive even in shade, like even in deep shade. It just, you might not get that same fruit show. And finally, there are some goldenrods that actually tolerate shade quite well. So uh, this is one called Solidago cecia. I will send, you'll get all these slides, don't worry, you do not need to be writing this down frantically. But it's a, you know, it's kind of a mid height, it's a tidy grower, it's very, very attractive. This is a picture I really, really like because you can see the Solidago, the goldenrod here. You can see this is actually that um, blue mist flower or hardy ageratum here. So it tolerates some shade. Back in the back, you can actually see uh, there's kind of a background of Joe Pieweed, 
Uh, Joe pie weed is another kind of top 25 pollinator plant that handles a little bit of shade. It comes in a very tall variety, like six feet tall. And then there's actually a native kind of wild variety called uh, little Joe pie that is only three or four feet tall. So if you have a smaller space, it works really well. Um, Debbie Ruse, the agent in Chatham County, who's really, really phenomenal with native plants, likes this plant so much that she named her dog Joe pie weed. So uh, like this is a great plant. This is an absolute winner. If you have more space, I would tell you to dream big. Um, so like I said earlier, native oaks support over 488 species and there are a number of different oaks you can choose from. Uh, you can choose, you know, you can go full Durham. <laughs> you can do a willow oak. Uh, we also have overcup oaks. We have uh, red oaks, white oaks, any number of different oaks. They are listed on the New Hope Audubon site, kind of some of the different varieties, how big they get, what sort of soil they like, what sort of water they need. If you have room and you can plant one thing, plant an oak. Plant an oak, plant an oak, plant an oak. They support so many different species, every different cycle of their life. They are just kind of a, I would say a keystone species in our area. If you can keep the soil around it open, even better. Don't have grass under it, just have it kind of open, kind of natural, because a lot of caterpillars will drop down and they'll burrow into the soil. And if there's grass and a lot of stuff there, it's harder for them to do it. But if it's kind of open and natural, you get the full life cycle of so many different species on this one tree. For extra amenities, how do you make it extra inviting, right? We've talked a lot about plants and we've talked a lot about planting uh, a diversity, but there are other things you can add to your environment to make it even better for wildlife. Obviously the classic, just because it's cute and it's fun, it's a bug hotel, right? So this is a really fun activity with kids. Um, I have done it myself. I know that uh, my dad got inspired and made a bunch too and none of, maybe children at heart, but not children, right? These are fun though. And these are fun kind of projects to work on. And what you need here is you just need a diversity of size of holes and you want a diversity of size of depths, right? And so you don't want anything um, too much small or too much bigger than, you know, three quarters of an inch in diameter. But there's a lot of information you can find online and I'll include some of it on kind of how to set these up, but they're really fun and really interesting to kind of see the holes get filled. And then all of a sudden uh, the, that means the insects are in there and it's just really, really cool. And so all these different bees will come and lay their little eggs in here and they'll do all their life cycle, which is really cool. I love a brush pile. Brush piles are awesome because not only do they mean you don't have to load all that stuff into your yard waste bin or your compost pile, you can kind of just pile it up and act like you're supporting the ecosystem. You actually are supporting the ecosystem and it's really phenomenal. These are great habitat for a lot of small animals. Um, they just really like to have this sort of refuge this is the season of letting your weeds go in your yard a little bit. So a lot of times these provide really early season nectar for insects that hardly anything else is out, right? Like the idea of that tiger swallowtail we talked about earlier. So just letting things go to flower, not being too diligent about keeping your lawn entirely grass, allowing some of those weeds, allowing some of them to flower, they can provide a, a good early season boost for a lot of insects. Also an argument for not being too diligent about your lawn. A lot of bees like to actually nest in the ground. A lot of the solitary bees do. And if the turf is too thick, they can't get through it. Whereas if your turf is kind of spotty like this turf is, these are actually all ground nesting bee mounds. And so it's bees emerging after the winter, having all grown up in the ground, emerging to fly off. Again, these are solitary bees, so they don't care about you. They really won't bother you for the most part. You won't have any trouble with them. It just allows them a, a chance to carry out their life cycle. Anytime you can leave fallen twigs or you can leave um, tr dead trees or snags or anything else like that, those provide excellent habitat. Um, they will get covered in lichen and fungi and everything else and insects will start living in them and woodpeckers will start trying to get the insects out of them and it'll be a real show. And they provide really, really good habitat anytime you can leave them. And finally, adding water is always a great idea. So this is a bird bubbler that was written about in the um, Triangle Gardener magazine. This woman made her own little bird bubbler. And so what it does is it just bubbles water out of the ground, kind of over the rock and recycles it. Even adding just a bird bath. Animals love water. They love having that fresh, clean water. Mosquitoes here are obviously terrible. So just tip it out, you know, ideally once a day if you're ambitious, uh, you know, at least a couple times a week, refill it. Um, and you will see so much action, right? Like it will be the life of the party and all the animals will really appreciate it. 
And part of what we need to think about really, when we think about planting natives, and this is kind of a, uh, we're, we're wrapping up a little bit here, is this idea of what does it mean when we say we want a pest-free garden, right? So these two plants we have here, it's Nandina and Lorapetalum on the right. You won't see much pest damage on these and that's because nothing has evolved to eat them, right? Typically pest damage, especially insect feeding damage, any of that kind of stuff is a sign that something has evolved to eat that plant. And so that can be frustrating and it's not always beautiful in the garden, but it means that the system's working. It means that the ecosystem is alive and there are certain plants that I would say plant them with the full intention that you will only have succeeded if the plant is destroyed, right? So something like milkweed, the system only worked if the milkweed is basically stripped back down to the stems and nothing else is there and it's covered in insect poop and happy caterpillars, right? Same with things like dill and fennel. Um, the damage is the goal and we need to kind of move beyond this idea of wanting perfect aesthetic gardens because we want spaces that are ecologically relevant and ecologically vibrant. And so similarly to that, this is one of my favorite pictures from the Pollinator Paradise Garden that Debbie Ruse has out in Chatham County. And she has all these beautiful, beautiful plantings all around it. And then this is actually a bike rack, but I would say it's a sculpture. And so it's beautiful and it serves a value for humans, right? It allows a human to park a bike there and that's really useful. It serves no value for the animals though. So it's a piece of art in the garden, right? And that's useful, but it, it's not ecologically useful. But there's value for having things for humans. Similarly, in Duke Gardens, they have beautiful paths and beautiful walkways. And they actually provide no ecological value, but they're there for us as humans. And that's how I would think about the idea of planting a garden, is I want the vast majority of my space to be native plants that are ecologically useful, ecologically vibrant, support a good, robust, set of insects and animals and everyone else. And it's okay for me to put in the occasional pretty thing just for me. It's okay for me to have my Edgeworthia. It's okay for me to have my sculpture. It's okay for me to have my non-native plant that makes me happy, but view it as art, right? View it as a sculpture. The animals don't use it, it looks good to you. And so I would say, you know, 70% native, 30% art, you're good to go. If you want to learn more, one of the absolute best books I've ever read on the topic is this one here, Nature's Best Hope. Uh, Douglas Tolmy is a researcher and academic. He's the one who's done a lot of the research, especially at the Mount Cuba Center, about what um, varieties insects can't identify and what makes a native, you know, versus a native are good. Um, he's really fascinating. This is, I would say, a book that is equal parts um, inspirational and just brass tacks, right? Telling you like, these are the things you should be planting. This is what you should be thinking about. This is how we make this relevant. This is a wonderful read, easy read. Um, just really, really great. And just to very finish up, because I can't not mention it, um, the Master Gardeners are having a plant sale right now with a lot of really good natives in it. Check it out if you want. Um, it's the backyardtreasuresplantsale.com. And finally, um, Keep Durham Beautiful will be doing a Durham Bio Blitz um, April 15th to 30th, where we'll be having folks go out as citizen scientists collecting a lot of interesting and useful information about what's out now so that we can have that information long term. So especially as things like climate change become more and more relevant, we have a good record of what used to be out when, right? This is kind of really important information. And so with that, I will take any questions. And may I start at the beginning, please? Yes. Summer bought some milkweed, swamp milkweed, and she wants to know, is that okay in Wake or Alamance County and good for monarchs? Totally great. That's a, that, is a, that is a gold star milkweed around here. Awesome. So Julie planted a Halesia carolina, which is a styrax of some sort. Um, it is supposed to like acidic soils rich in humus. My soil pH is around 7.3, so I added composted pine bark and a sponge soil acidifier and hollytone, should I have done something differently? No, I, I, I think that you're good. I, I think that uh, I'm willing to admit it's a tiny bit of a gamble with that plant, whether that was enough to fix the pH from its perspective. But if you like that plant and you're excited about it, I think that you did everything you could to make your soil better. And I would plant it and uh, I might have one set of fingers crossed, but I, I don't think you need two sets of fingers crossed. And just keep an eye on it and make sure it stays happy. My Styrax is fabulous, but my soil may be, may be more acidic than hers. Um, and, you know, there's always that issue of is it enough to make enough of a difference, being that you're putting this into the 
into the ground around it, but then it's eventually going to leak away. Yeah, you're combating the earth. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next thing is, I heard that Jess says that I heard that North Carolina has more extensive plant diversity than anywhere else in the country. Is this true? Are there a lot of specialist pollinator species that we should be trying to support? Oh, two-parter. It's a great two-parter. Okay, so North Carolina is fascinating. Um, the reason for this is because we are both right on the edge from north to south of a major climate difference, right? Like up further north, it's significantly colder. Down further south, it's significantly warmer. And like we're kind of right on the edge of where that divide is from a plant's perspective. And so we tend to get a little bit of bleed over from both directions. So we have high diversity because of that. And then also because you go from the coast to the mountains. And like I was saying, you go from sea level to Ontario, essentially. We have a tremendous amount of diversity because of our elevation change. So actually we are one of the most diverse places in the United States, um, really phenomenal. As far as specialist pollinators, um, Again, that's one that it wouldn't surprise me if that were the case. I don't know specific numbers on that. But what I'll say is that typically if you plant plants that support a large number of species, so like something like an oak or something like a goldenrod, they might catch a couple of specialists and they will catch a bunch of things that can go and feed on any number of different species, right? So you might catch five bees that don't care what they're feeding on. And also that one bee who's very, very specific and will only feed on that goldenrod. So those five bees who don't care what they're feeding on are called generalists. That one bee who really cares is called a specialist. If you plant for the generalists, you typically catch the specialists as well. So it's good to just be planting plants that can support as many species as possible if you're trying to prioritize. All right, Julie says that her swamp milkweed beetle devoured her tropical milkweed last year before the monarchs arrived. What to do this year? I'm trying to raise common milkweed from seeds. Should I pull out any tropical milkweeds that emerge due to the timing mismatch? I probably would. I would if I was if I was concerned about it. Um, I would switch to not tropical milkweed. Um, but those milkweed bugs are are a pill. I mean, they're a pill and a half because you want monarchs and they show up. They're native though in their defense. So I would say, <laughs> that's not really a strong answer. Sorry. I would say, um, keep going with your milkweed from seed. Uh, if you're concerned, I would certainly start trying to take out some of the tropical milkweed. I was starting, especially as you have the milkweed from seed growing up and those plants getting stronger and better. Um, Joseph wants to know if there are any suggestions for sites with poor soil. Um, and, you know, I don't know if Joseph has tested the soil or not, but certainly that's something he might need to do. Yeah, and so what I would say is that, it, it, like you're saying, it depends on what you mean by poor soil. I will send around resources on soil testing and so how you can know what sort of um, nutrient deficiencies you might have or anything else like that. As far as conditions like the soil is too wet, the soil is too dry, you know, any of that kind of stuff, a lot of that can be um, really neutralized by the addition of organic matter, by the addition of compost. I would always be adding or organic matter and compost when I was planting if I could. Um, and there are also plants you can pick specifically that will tolerate dry conditions, wet conditions, anything else like that. So that really goes back to the kind of the master gardener mantra of right plant, right place. And if you know what your place is, you can probably find a plant to suit it, um, especially if you're willing to, to spend a little bit of time someplace like the plant toolbox. Because I could plug in, you know, native, dry, sunny, and it would pop something up for me. All right. That is all of the questions I have. It is 7.59, so we should be respectful of everybody's time. And as you can see, a lot of people are grateful um, for your knowledge. And um, uh, Brooks wants to know he's growing common milkweed from seed, wondering when I should transfer to the ground. Our frost date here is late April 11. I have a secret suspicion we're past frost, but I'm not going to say that. Um, yeah, April 11. I would say I um, I like to wait until a plant has a little little bit of size on it, you know, something like this at least, not too, too young. And the reason for that is because uh, I tend to forget that I've planted things and I forget to water them. And if they have a little bit more size on them, they're a little bit more resilient. So I would just wait until they're, they've got a little bit of size on them and then transplant them out. All right. 
Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining us this evening for Ashley's most fabulous talk. Um, and we will be allowing everybody to leave now. <laughs> and we'll see you next month. Class dismissed. Something like that. Um, Thank you. So, well, I know your, your mother was there for a moment somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Awesome. You're welcome, Drew. I'm glad you mentioned the plant sale because I knew you were doing it. And I'm in the Orange County Master Gardeners, but I was like searching around today, like, where is it? Where is it? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, there's still a lot of good stuff left. So it's pretty exciting. Good. Thanks again. Absolutely.